Hey guys, Brendan of Productions here, and welcome back for part two of how to create Snake in Java. Where we left off on part one was a little sketchy. We gave a quick overview of the project. Um, we mentioned that what we're going to need to do is draw fruit, a snake body, and nothing onto the screen. And we also needed uh, directions of north, south, east, and west. We explained the logic of how our snake is actually going to move across the screen, as well as that we needed a grid. To kick things off in that tutorial, we actually made a tile type class, which consisted of three tile type enumerations, and then we actually created a canvas, um, which had a few variables uh, declaring the height width of the boxes and the height and width of the grid, as well as actually declared the snake as a linked list of points. We actually created the draw grid method, which actually drew the grid onto the screen. Now our next step is actually um, drawing the rest of the objects onto the screen. So what we want to do with our um, draw method here is the first thing we want to do is we want to draw the grid, since that's going to need to be on the bottom of the screen. Now the next thing we want to do actually after we draw the grid is draw the snake. So we're going to say public void draw snake. And this is going to actually inherit or take a graphics G as a parameter. So this is going to work just like the draw grid method. It's going to get thrown a graphics by the draw method and is actually going to draw the snake. So drawing the snake should be easy. All we need to do is draw a box um, where the snake points are. So we're just going to go ahead and um, say g.draw. Actually, we're going to change the color. So we're going to say g.setColor, and then we're going to say color.green. So we're going to change the color of green for this snake, because this is a green snake. And we're just going to import color, so it allows us to do that. And then we're just going to go ahead and say g.fill or for, so we're going to loop through the points in our snake here. So we're going to use a, a classic for loop that um, goes ahead and searches through all the objects. So we're just going to say for point P in snake. What this is essentially saying is for every point in snake, we're just going to call it P. What do you want to do? So we're going to say g.fillRect, and we're just going to say p.x p.y, which is the x and y coordinates. The width and height are going to be the box width and the box height. And then after we're done, we're going to set the color back to black. Throughout this project, you're going to see a, um, a black color scheme going on. So everything we're drawing is in black. So now that we actually have our draw snake method, we can go ahead and pop that into our draw method. So after we draw the grid, we're going to want to draw the snake onto the screen. Send in G, of course. And finally, what we want to do now is we want to actually draw the fruit. Now, there are several ways of actually going about the fruit. Uh, in our first tutorial, we actually declared that there would be a tile type variable that actually included all of the, um, the tiles, and then we're going to work on a tile system. Although this, in theory, would work uh, for simplicity's sake, I'm just going to go ahead and disregard that tile type system and simply use link list to actually create what we're looking for. Now, instead of using a link list, so what we're working, looking at right now is the fruit. So what the fruit is is essentially a point on the grid that you can run into, and once you run into that point, um, you are going to grow a little bit. So what we're going to do is we're going to add a point to the linked list. So since all the fruit is is a point, all we need to do is create a point variable keeping track of where the fruit is. So we're going to go ahead and do that. We're going to say private point fruit. So now we can assume that the fruit is going to be a valid point, and we can go ahead and create a draw fruit method. So we're just going to say public void draw fruit. And of course, it's going to take in a graphics G. And then inside this method, we're just going to say g.setColor red, because we're going to say it's an apple. Uh, <laughs> color dot apple. Whoops. <laughs> so we're just going to say it's an apple and it needs to be red. And then what we want to do is we just want to g dot fill rect. Actually, we're going to fill a circle here. How about that? How's that sound? Um, can we fill a circle? We can fill an oval, which is essentially a circle if it has the same x and y. So um, we're going to fill it, or the same width and height rather. So we're going to go ahead and fill the x and y or fill in the circle. I am tired. I am so sorry. So we're going to fill in the oval at the point of the fruit. So we're just going to say fruit.x, fruit.y, and then the width and height are just going to be the box width and the box height. 
So now we've actually got a draw fruit method, and we can go ahead and pop this into our draw method. So now that we've got our draw method all coordinated, we can go ahead and start working on our main game loop. So right now we haven't even constructed any logic of the game. We've just built the framework that our game is going to run upon. We have our snake object, our fruit object, and then we've got our draw methods. So this was the easy stuff. Now we actually need to get into the logic of the game. So the first thing we want to actually do is we want to create a loop that is constantly running in the background that is constantly actually calculating what we want the game to do. So in order to actually make this loop, we're going to make the loop on a separate thread. So in order to do that, we're actually going to make this class a runnable. Now what's a runnable? Well, okay, first of all, what's a thread? In computer science, or in computers, each process, or each, the computer runs on, let's just talk in general terms, um, in layman's terms, if you will. So there are multiple threads that your program can actually run on. Each of these threads is actually completely separate from one another. So if you actually want to do multiple things at once without conflicting with one another, you want to run each thing on a separate thread. So this is how big programs are able to do um, huge calculations at once. For example, um, 3D modeling applications like 3D's Max utilizes many threads in order to actually um, do this. Now the more cores that your CPU has, the more threads available there are. Now, please don't quote me on this. I have no idea if this is correct. But the, the more cores your CPU has, the more threads that are available. That's why um, CPUs with more cores are able to use 3D modeling applications and CPU-intensive applications more efficiently, because they have more threads to actually give the application. Therefore, the application can do more at once. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to utilize this sort of implementation. And our canvas is actually running it on its own thread right now. But what we want to do is we actually want to create a new thread that is actually going to use our loop. So the canvas is running in its own thread, while at the same time in a background, a loop is constantly running that's doing all the calculations for us. But in order to actually make the thread, we need to tell the thread what to do when we start it. So what we want to do is we actually want to make our class implement a runnable, which is an object that contains a run method um, that we can send into a thread. And then the thread will constantly run that run method. So what we want to do is we're actually going to click on this little arrow here, and it's going to tell us to add our Im unimplemented methods for runnable. And then once we do that, we can scroll down to the bottom, and you can see that we've got our run method. Or you could have, um, alternatively, you could have simply typed in public void run. So now we've got a run method that is going to constantly be running in the background once we assign it to a thread. So what we want to do is we want to say simply while true. Now if you're familiar with while loops, what this does is everything within this code runs indefinitely. Since we're saying while true, which is always true because true is always true, everything in this while loop is going to constantly loop. Which is good for us because we need something in the background to constantly loop in order to actually make our game work. So since this is going to run indefinitely, there are a few things that we want to do inside of this while loop. The first thing we want to do is we're actually going to want to um, do our calculations. However, if we think about the snake game, um, our calculations, what occurs during our calculations? The snake moves. So we're going to go ahead and create a new method, a currently blank method, public void move. So this method is going to be called in our calculations. We're going to call the move method. And since this is really the only method that contains logic, um, we're just going to go ahead and um, then call the draw method. Now the draw method needs graphics, of course, so we're going to address that shortly. However, what, we, what will happen with this method is since it says while true, it will constantly be running, constantly be refreshing itself. Every millisecond this method will run. Well, that will make our game run at lightning speed, and that will make everything loop really quickly, and our, character, our snake will be moving um, at light speed, let's say. So what we want to do is we actually want to put a small buffer on this to make our application actually slow down. So we're just going to create a simple try block here and a catch exception e. Uh, so we're going to catch any exceptions. And then if an exception occurs, we're just going to say e.printStackTrace, uh, which is the generic way of handling exceptions. So what we want to do is we actually want to stop this thread for a little bit. So we want to say thread.currentThread 
And then once, so what this does is this actually accesses the thread that we're currently on. And since we're in the rum loop, um, we're going to be on the separate thread. So once we've accessed the thread that we're currently on, we can go ahead and say thread.sleep, and we're going to want to sleep for maybe 100 milliseconds, which is about a tenth of a second, which means that our game is going to be up, updating itself every tenth of a second. So that's essentially a game running at 10 frames per second. Which you know that's okay, because Snake doesn't really need to run at full 1080p 60 frames per second. This is not Battlefield 3. Or Battlefield 4, which is coming out soon. But anyway, let's not get into that. So now that we've got our run method with a small buffer on it, and then a draw method that currently throws an error, we need to actually create a thread. So in our global variables section, which is actually here, uh, we're going to say we're going to want to create a private thread run thread. So this is simply another object that is capable of running things in the background. This is the god object, if you will. This is what we need to use to make all of our applications run multitask, essentially. So when our canvas is actually created, what we need to do is we need to make sure that run thread is actually a new object, and if it is a new object, then we need to assign it to our runnable and start it up. So there's one method that's actually run when this, run, or when this canvas is actually created and that's the paint method. Just like the applet, a canvas starts off with a paint method, and it is also given a free graphics object to use. So what we want to do in this paint method is um, there's going to be a few things that we need to do. So the first thing we need to do is we need to create a global graphics. So we're going to create a private graphics object called global graphics. So when the applet is actually created, it will send over a graphics object to the canvas to utilize, which is what we're going to be utilizing here. However, all of our methods actually use a graphics. So what we need to do is we need to actually capture this graphics object. So the first thing we need to do is say global global graphics equals g dot create. So what this is going to do is it's going to take the graphics that it allowed us to use, and we're going to create a copy of that graphics and assign it to our global graphics method. So once we've actually assigned our global graphics method, we need to address our run thread object. So currently our run thread object is nothing. It is null. So what we need to do is we need to say if run thread is null, then we actually need to create a new thread off of it and send in a runnable. So we're going to say run thread equals new thread. And as you can see here, as a parameter, what we want is a runnable target. Well, our class here, Snake Canvas, actually implements Runnable. So we can go ahead and just send in our Snake Canvas. We can do this by saying this. Now that run thread is actually a new thread, we're just going to go ahead and start it up. So we're going to say run thread dot start. So this will go ahead and start the thread on an external um, memory space, if you will. And then it will go ahead and run our run method, which, of course, loops constantly. So now that we've actually got a global graphics method here, um, which is going to be g.create, um, we can actually go ahead and send in a graphics method for, or a graphics object for our draw method. So we can go ahead and say global graphics. So now we've got an error-free application, and there's only a few things we need to address. The first of which being our linked list and points. As you can see, both of these objects are currently null. Well, this will definitely throw runtime errors when we run the program because we'll try to access data that isn't there. So we need to actually go ahead and make these objects something to actually calculate with. So we're going to say snake equals new linked list. And keep in mind, this is a linked list of points. And then we want to send in no parameters for this certain statement. And we also want to say that fruit is a new point. And we're just going to go ahead and um, leave it at that. So now that our paint method is called, we're actually going to have a new running instance of snake, fruit, global graphics, and our run thread will be started. That is a heck of a lot to actually manage, but Java can do it. Okay, so this concludes our, our logic portion of our actual snake game. So in snake in um, snake in part three of this tutorial series, I'm actually going to be discussing the moving of the snake and implementing user controls. We actually haven't able, been able to actually draw anything onto the screen either because we don't have an applet. So we're going to need to add our applet to the application as well that will actually take our canvas and draw it onto our applet. 
So look out for part three of this series, which is going to explain just how to do that. In the meantime, thanks for watching. Please remember to rate, comment, and subscribe. Talk to you guys later. Peace.